Welcome, everybody. Um, without much further ado, we're going to begin by throwing you into a clip with no preface. Um, one, it, well, I will say that it is from... You guys watched the film Infinity Minus Infinity, and this is from another film called... The Nucleus of, the nucleus great of a Great Union. <laughs> Um, so we'll watch a piece of that and then discuss. Yeah. Okay, let's see if it works. Could we turn the lights down, please? Thank you. 
and that's from a film called Nucleus of a Great Union. Supposed to be on. Can you hear me? No. Does that work? I will project. Um, you two often describe your practice as research based. And um, you work with a lot of archival materials. And what we're seeing here are some archival materials. And I wonder if you talk a little bit about where those materials came from and how you have set them in motion here. good way of giving people a sense of what's at, what's at play in this work of the nucleus of the great union. So um, what you see are um, photographs by Richard Wright. Um, you know, I think in America, I don't need to point out the, the, the kind of the status of Richard Wright, maybe the most important uh, African-American writer maybe the most globally well-known writer in the 1940s. But this is 1953. Um, Wright is in the Gold Coast. Um, he's there to report on the CPP, the Convention of People's Party, the biggest mass socialist party on the west coast of the continent. Um, and, but he's also there to encounter um, in a way to, to, to stage a confrontation between, um, between African-American history um, and genesis and the African coastline. So he's there to stage a kind of encounter between um, the new world and the old world. And he writes Black Power a record of reactions in the land of pathos. An extremely controversial book because in this book he confronts the notion of, um, of Africa as a continent that can suture the rupture, the ontological rupture of the Middle Passage. So instead of, conf instead of encountering the Gold Coast as the motherland, was returning home or was a, a space of redemption, he confronts um, his own sense of alienation and distance, um, embarrassment, anger, disappointment, shame, a whole range of a whole range of ugly feelings that he confronts uh, throughout the Gold Coast. So he really pioneers a kind of existential dilemma between what African Americans have become and their confrontation with the descendants of the ancestors who sold them into slavery. And so, um, and he really sets in, in motion a whole way of talking about the African continent, um, a really complex way of dwelling inside the, the kind of alienation of that encounter, which we can see all the way up to, say, lose your mother. It's that trajectory. Um, but what people don't know is that he also took two cameras with him, uh, a Leica and I think a Rolleiflex, and he shot several hundred photographs, about 1,600, and they are all in the Beinecke at Yale. So we went to Beinecke's, and what you see are some of those photographs, and what you read are excerpts from um, Richard Wright's first draft of Black Power, which is a masterpiece, it's like 900 pages. And so we put these two together to stage what we call a kind of intertemporal conversation between um, Wright's images, Wright's captions, and the, 
the, the kind of the technical conditions of these digital objects called JPEGs or TIFFs that the Beinecke requires you to interface with. So we've, um, in a way, it's it's about it's a, it's it's a it's a bit about showing in a way our distance towards Wright's distance. You know, so Wright saw this encounter as a question of pathos. And our, our question is, is a kind of distance towards that pathos, but also a kind of a kind of connection across that distance. Maybe like um, when uh, Nathaniel Mackey calls, talks about a broken claim to connection, that's part of what is at stake in right. And maybe maybe part of our project was to try to to re-narrate that broken claim to connection. This time through, in a way, a kind of technical object, which is a tip, maybe. Maybe that, that begins to sketch out part of what's at stake in this, you know, in the visit, in the revisiting of this archive from 53 in the year of 2017. I mean, I think it um, relates very much to, I would say, a kind of challenge that we set ourselves when we first started Otolith, which was just after 9-11, um, where we profoundly had a sense that this event was going to produce forms of closure that were going to, um, you know, last for a very long time. We didn't quite expect things to get as bad as they are, but um, they have. Um, and it, you know, we, we set ourselves this challenge of thinking around uh, a term called past, potential, and futures, thinking about how many different, um, I think that was a term by Agamben at the time. Um, and I think the, the reason for that was because we realized that I had a sense that many histories, many um, movements that seem to be taking shape across um, the developing world or, let's say, the global south would be closed down slowly, slowly. Um, an internal enemy had been produced or an internal en enemy kind of emerged. Um, and we, we wanted to set ourselves the challenge of thinking um, around a, a, a term by J.G. Ballard called, where he describes science fiction, uh, an idea of the science fictioning of the present um, with the idea of a kind of past potential future. Um, and our first film, Otolith, we staged in microgravity with the Russian Space Agency and opened up, I guess, this uh, scalar space between the cosmos and the Earth. And in this interscalar space, we, um, I suppose, thought of the filmmaking process or the video making process um, as a way to deal with the different scales of thinking. We felt that the only way through time was not to think of time as a kind of march towards the future or even in a way like, you know, a Benjaminian time of like of the last angel but more like a time of um, thinking along the lines of how we get through this time into another time um, yes so that's kind of I would say some of the ideas behind the way that we put images and sounds together and all of the work but in this clip in particular we're sort of hovering in the in between there's no clear demarcation of past or future. It's um, these conversations that are non-conversations that, that, that seek contact but don't quite get it. Um, the, photo the formations that the photographs create but don't quite create because they don't touch, um, those all suggest a kind of suspension um, poised to perhaps make the kind of connections that Wright, Wright saw that maybe you saw it in working through Wright's archive. Um, so how, um, why, in my conversations with you, I know that this sense of intertemporality 
uh, in this in-betweenness in time is important to you. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, I think it, it has a lot to do with um, so rights, you know, the, the future that right is looking forward to in 1983. Um, right for the Gold Coast, um, the pilot, a pilot project for a new Africa. So this 1953 is the same time that George Padmore is writing what will become the Gold Coast Revolution. Um, it's the same time C.L.R. James is putting together the first draft of what will become improving the Gold Revolution. So there's a sense of a, you know, one of those moments where um, a world historical turn is taking place in this small country on the west coast of the continent. Um, all kinds of people find their way there, and Wright is one of the first. So at this moment in time, the Gold Coast is is filled with a horizon of expectation, uh, it's filled with promise, filled with futurity, filled with anticipation and expectation. Um, clearly, Wright's future is now our past. Clearly, we live in the temporal ruins of Wright's future past, which is now our past future. And the effort is to narrate the, the, the kind of the tension between that future past and that past future. How to narrate it in a mode that is um, how to convey a structure of temporal feeling that is particular to our time? That's the question. How do you, how do you go about um, catching the texture of that temporal structure of experience that emerges when you confront these images, and these captions? Um, so it's a lot of it is to do with orchestrating certain kinds of emotional conditions. The, the tension that you talk about, the suspension, the kind of uncertain, uncertain temporal location. Of where is it? Where is the set? Is it set inside a computer screen? Is it set in 1953 as imagined from the perspective of a JPEG? What is the what is the structure of 2017 anyway from which we're looking at 1953? Which 2017 are we talking about? Which 1953? So it's an effort to open up these questions by constructing these slightly um, slightly ominous photographic entities. Um, I mean, right. I think Wright, when you look at Wright's writings, he's really drawn to, to what we would call ugly feelings. He's really drawn to things that embarrass him, things that he finds inexplicable, things that he finds um, shameful, things that he finds humiliating. It's part of what makes Black Boy such a powerful book. And uh, he's highly attentive to that, and it's as if he's using his camera both to, both to distance himself from these moments and to, to picture them. Um, and so when you look at a lot of these photographs, a charge comes off them, you know, travels through time to us. And, and, um, and the text is full of these uncomfortable moments British, the Americans, the uh, National Liberation Movement in the Ashanti region are, are, are holding effectively a bombing campaign against the Convention People's Party. It's an extremely tense Cold War setting. I think Wright thought he'd be treated as a hero when he arrived in the Gold Coast, but far from it. So when you put together all of this suspicion that breeds Wright, as this African-American man in a pit helmet and two cameras marching up and down Temo and Takaradi and Kumasi and Accra, expecting everybody to know who he is. Um, you get this you get a convergence of uncomfortable, somewhat dissonant emotional situations 
where nobody is quite clear of how to behave. It's not as if this has happened before. This is all new. This idea of a mass socialist party on the west coast of Africa, it's new. That's why, that's why right's there. So nobody quite has a script for how to behave. Not the masses that we see, not the intelligentsia from the US, not the intelligentsia from the Gold Coast, not the British, not the American. Nobody quite has a script. The script will be written soon, but it's not yet there. So you, would, so you have this dramatic cast, and everybody's slightly uneasy. So that part of our project maybe is to is to heighten, is to restore, not is to, is to kind of try to heighten that sense with all of the, the unguaranteed nature of what was going on then in order to draw out some of the drama that these photographs carry with them and in order to give these, these still images their, their capacity to move so that they don't, they don't index in history. They don't index a history. They are something like untrustworthy and, and unstable agents rather than trustworthy messengers or reporters of a history. They're like untrustworthy actors. And maybe that's part of what we want to what we want to convey. of it in relation, I think of it quite haptically in relation to putting your lips on history in a way like, um, you know, in, in a way the kind of sense of these sort of peripheries of ideologies that you move through in the work, um, the frontiers of certain belief systems, um, the limits of um, empire, you know, and, uh, and uh, kind of independence movements and the complexity of these movements, especially on the Gold, the Gold Coast. Um, it's almost like when P Pedro talks about a charge, the idea is to sort of, I guess, sort of create a porosity that would uh, allow for all of these sensations or these structures of feeling that are unfamiliar even to us to breathe, if you like. So one would sort of be able to have a sense of that history as something tangible. Smoothly, 
don't even realize it's so obscure. I I don't know how he mentally could have been prepared. So that's within the spell. The the meeting and the speaking up is far more fundamental. The word the meeting is what really sets the tone and the mood of the spell. The word the meeting is what sets the tone and the mood. This is a strong element that comes into play. In fact, there's no bad word. Strongest foundation, Ghana, Guinea, Mali. The nucleus of the great union, Ghana, Guinea, Mali. Has now once been laid forever. First it was Ghana and Guinea, later Ghana, Guinea, Mali. Soon it will be all Africa. So of course it's full of pathos because there is a union between Ghana and Guinea, but the fourth, the fourth link in the nucleus is that it's in the Congo. That's why it's in Africa. Ah, and yeah. we know what happens to Lumumba. There's a, a counter-revolution begins right there because if the Congo joins Ghana, Guinea, Mali, then that really would have been the foundation for the United States of Africa. So Pan-Africanism was not a dream. It was a project which was violently terminated because it genuinely threatened to reshape the world order. So, so all of that pathos is contained inside that notion of the nucleus of a great union, and it's kind of remarkable to us that you can you can embed you can embed such um, meaning, such powerful meaning into a song which is so graceful, so delicate. So, so charming, you know, so you can imagine, you know, those, those photographs you've seen of Malik Sidibe and Seydou Keita, those photographs of couples dancing, when you watch those photographs, when you look at them, you can hear this soundtrack playing. So, so all of that, that, so pathos, there's already a kind of intertemporality embedded in pathos. And in a way... In a way, we wanted to to redirect that intertemporal pathos, which I wouldn't call nostalgia. I'd call it more of like a bittersweet texture for what Anjali was talking about, this kind of the past potential futures, or, or you know, a specific relation between between past, present, and future, in which if, in which a, a terminated future clearly haunt the present as some kind of temporal ruin. Um, and these photos allow us to access that, but differently. It's as if um, we get to emplot this moment, not in the mode of tragedy or romance or comedy, but in, in the name of some other mode of emplotment that we don't quite have a name for it, you know. Um, because in a way, Wright's tragedy, you know, it's not it's not the same as our tragedy, you know. Um, so that's part of what is at stake in, in in kind of revisiting and recompositing this moment. It's to it's to um, it's to do aesthetic justice to to the the temporality of transitional moments that we feel ourselves to be living. We know we are not the we are not the heroic generation of 
to my parents, we know that we have our own battles to fight. We have our own struggles to fight. We know that what constitutes a generation is what David Scott calls um, uh, a, a, a temporal institution. That's what a generation is. So in maybe we're also trying to work out a kind of generational response to, to these, these, these archives, which precisely because they're so, they're so um, unviewed and so they're not publicly processed, they, they, they hard, they've hardly been seen in a bar, for example. Precisely because of that, they retain a huge amount they retain a huge amount of charm, which we can, which we can channel in certain ways along certain paths to certain effects, even when we don't necessarily have a language for what what it is we're doing. Not yet. Part of being here with you is to build that language. This is actually one of the first times we've ever spoken about this work. You know, in the in the five years that we've made it. And you're the first person who's ever identified it as a, as a work that we can have a dialogue around. So it's very precious to us. Mm-hmm. Um, so we just want to add anything? Okay. Yeah. Um, well, in our prior conversations, you talked about intertemporality as being both the object of inquiry and the aesthetic mode of this film. And in the next clip we're going to watch, you describe, uh, and you told me this, it's interscalarity. Is that even how I say that word? Yeah. Um, the interscalars, interscalarity, um, that is, again, the object of inquiry and the aesthetic mode of the next um, clip that we'll watch, which, com- which comes from the film, sorry, which comes from the film that you've already seen, Infinity Minus Infinity. Lights, please. I hope the sound works. Sorry, I'll begin, begin again. Sorry. Have the sound up a bit, please. Anthropocene um, brings into view an idea of geologic subjectivity, but it's a universalizing subjectivity. It lumps us all in together as the lithic and undifferentiated geology. In the interstices, between the past and future. A second front of the Cold War intensifies operations. In the months before the International Geophysical Year, a consortium of scientists from around the globe meet to erase differences between East and West. They told us to buy telescopes, to turn our lenses to the mirrors lined in overlapping circles on the ground while we watched the slow revolutions of the moon and tracked the orbiting of man-made satellites.
a few years earlier, the U.S. detonated the world's most powerful thermonuclear bombs amid the Pacific atolls, withholding recompense from the people they displaced. And a few weeks later, Great Britain, insistent on the primacy of its imperial prowess, attempted to invade Egypt. The empire splits apart, begins its long slide beneath Territorial waters. A record of trauma. Commodity. Anthropocene places the apocalypse as something to come and thereby erases all the other apocalypse that its structure of thought and its structure of material relations put into place since 1492. If we start with the end of the world, then we start from a very different place where that anti-black impetus of extraction is at the heart and center of our thinking. The invasion of Europeans in the Americas resulted in a massive genocide of the indigenous population, leading to a decline from 54 million people to approximately 6 million. This led to a massive reduction in farming and the regeneration of forests and carbon uptake leading to an observed decline in Antarctic ice cores of CO2 in the atmosphere. Blindness, a subsequent injury, a blow to the body. It wove myths around us, so opaque that we too could not see, could not feel. Um, the, the, the passage 
through the ears, the, the body that you can see through, um, the choreography of scale that you have, um, or, uh, or that you have created here is beautiful and amazing. And um, I wonder how many charges you have here. I wonder if you could say more about that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not going to actually tell you the story of how it really happened, <laughs> because you'll think I'm mad and probably have me sent off to some asylum. But, um, you know, because uh, it, the um, ideas came to me through a series of coincidences, actually, um, but uh, that kind of showed me in a way that I was sort of on the right path um, with a series of ideas. So it was like a kind of, um, yeah, uh, s something, somewhere, or a series of energies kind of giving me the sense that, okay, this is, a, this is possibly a good idea. Um, but there were several things that were going on politically at the time that this um, idea of this film emerged um, that I, say, I would say have been gestating uh, in British politics for a long time, um, and you know, um, in relation to the question and the and the kind of, let's say, the complex arguments that take place, you know, in terms of this idea of the Anthropocene, uh, which we were, you know, invited to work alongside or work um, uh, in relation to the kind of periodizing that these seventeen geologists who gathered in Berlin in whenever it was when was it, Kojo? Um, 2014, we were invited to the Hakeve House de Culture and Welt in Berlin to, with a couple of other artists, to respond to the Anthropocene, uh, to respond to these uh, geologists. And there were several events where one became aware of the kind of complexity of periodizing when the apocalypse begins, you know. Um, so this had all, we'd been thinking about this, you know, I would say forever, but. Um, when the in, when um, Extinction Rebellion started demonstrating in London um, at that time, around that time, we met a group um, called uh, the Wretched of the Earth, um, who were a group of uh, environmental activists um, who were thinking more in relation to the, um, the a kind of direct relationship to racism and racial capitalism and. Um, environmental and climate change, yeah. So we wanted to bring this, these two ideas together. You know, how do you bring, you know, um, um, the idea of racial capitalism and the idea of environmental collapse into relation? There was another something else going on, which was the Compensation Act in the UK, which was, um, a kind of co which is sort of detailed in this film, whereby the 48,000 uh, slave owners in, um, I can't remember the year right now, who were, um, you know, paid off basically to end slavery, uh, we as taxpayers had been paying them off um, up until 2016. Millions and millions of pounds. This was a fun Friday fact tweeted and then taken down by the government. So there was that going on. Um, the k kind of Theresa May's announcement that, you know, Britain, which has been kind of like taken on with great gusto by our recent uh, government, um, changing government from lettuces to like God knows what. Um, sorry, it's a little joke that was p um, all over the internet around Liz Truss. Lasting, long, lasting for a shorter time in government than a lettuce. Um, that, you know, going, a lettuce that might rot. Um, so the hostile environment um, that Theresa May kind of put in, announced in 2012, um, you know, f you know, has you know, and uh, the situation for Caribbean people in the UK um, and all of the violence that's been done on that Windrush generation, that was also um, playing on our hearts and minds at the same time. Um, so we wanted to, and then, 
there was um, Denise Ferreira de Silva, who's um, here in the audience, um, quite coincidentally, <laughs> um, and her work um, looking at um, the, in, in this film, we kind of act out this, uh, this, uh, this idea of the equation of value that, um, is, that she articulates. Um, and Denise's work um, in general in relation to the poetical and many other ideas and conversations that we had um, began to kind of foment this, um, this challenge, you know, of how do you, bring, how do you bring these different things into relation. And the, uh, the um, sense of time not being linear and the sense of time being interscalar uh, for us, for me, was very much around like, well, how do we actually create portals um, to go through time, through our senses, to um, this uh, space of like, let's say, um, uh, that is, uh, you know, imminent. There's this kind of state of imminence um, kind of going on in relation to the way that the camera travels through um, the fingernails and through the third eye and through the eye and through the ear, in that um, all of these different spaces um, kind of allow a kind of consciousness to be in this state of like on this kind of axis of like it can go one way or another. I mean, there's a lot more to say about the work, ex you know, in relation to how these kind of portals and the green screen um, unfolded. Yeah, maybe I'll say a bit about the green screen. Why just don't you say just, just a little bit, and then I think everyone needs a break, and then we'll come back and you can elaborate during questions. Sure. I think Omar gave me a, a, a hard deadline, so. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's crazy, where does the time go? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, um, maybe I'll just pick up briefly from what I think said about green screening, which can speak to your question about chronology of scale. Because what allows us to move between the scales that Anjali points out is green screen, chroma key, compositing. We call it the, the key to the chromatic kingdom because green screen allows a certain plasticity even more precisely, allows a certain um, non-predication. So you can, you can create new attributes, qualities, predicates to entities. In fact, you can create entities. So, so there are figures, but now they have different predicates. They're predicated differently. They behave differently. They have different attributes. They are, they're magnified. They're enlarged. Extended. So that kind of um, uh, imagistic plasticity becomes available. So you can treat time with that kind of plasticity. Um, the side effect of that plasticity is a certain kind of um, a certain kind of gravitational uh, a certain gravitational grotesqueness, as if um, the, the choreography of scale generates um, a kind of incongruity, kind of a continuous incongruity and a continuous discrepancy. Um, and this discrepancy um, is sometimes grotesque, sometimes queasy, sometimes beautiful, sometimes it's hard to know what to make of the certain, the kinds of friction when different scales at different levels of different entities and different times rub up against each other. Um, and when you combine that with animation, at certain moments of animation, you gain that sense of, um, that sense of dilation and that sense of interscalarity. So that's really, this project was an experiment in that. So the aesthetic, the aesthetic of interscalarity comes through working with this green screen, like saturating the work such that, you know, in a way, green screen becomes the, the, the kind of zero ground from which you then build out predications and entities. So, you know, it's 
not clear who is human in this work. That's it. There is a kind of extra temporal effect. Figures seem to behave more like goddesses. They seem to, yeah. they seem to exist slightly outside of conventional time frames. And that's green. In other words, green screen allows you to 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 gesture towards the cosmological. It allow. It's a kind of a low budget entry into into a kind of yeah a dimension of the the cosmogonic cosmogonic. It really does allow that, and um, I think there's a reason why a lot of artists work with green screen, and there's a reason why a lot of artists are thinking about scale. The Anthropocene clearly forces it upon one, and then when you think of the Anthropocene as a capitalocene and as a racial capitalocene, if you take that seriously question of scale cannot but impinge on you as a question which is simultaneously um, ethical and aesthetic and political. Do you want to add yeah, I mean, there's, you know, there's, I just wanted to say that, you know, mo the senses and as portals were not, um, they were, they were kind of drawn from, you know, a quote uh, um, that I read in, on Karl Marx's idea that the senses are our theoreticians, but also this, um, um, you know, within, um, let's say, kind of within philosophy or um, in India, or certain, uh, it's difficult to say, I don't, I hate, I mean, I'm not going to say Hindu, um, but, it, you know, it could be like, um, let's say, philosophy emerging from the, or from, from the subcontinent, whereby the senses are, um, you know, the senses are actually, yes, theoreticians, it's interesting that Marx thinks of them as theoreticians because in meditation, the senses, um, uh, one locks the senses in order to travel inside um, and through consciousness um, in order to kind of have this sense of, um, you know, nirvana or kind of all, like an all-powerful, um, intelligent, um, beautiful energy. Um, this um, idea of the senses as, uh, yeah, portals to that energy is kind of, you know, what we kind of were kind of exploring, but also with the multi-headed goddess. This wasn't um, a device of, I don't know, like, an, it, I mean, of course, it kind of speaks to a kind of certain kind of album cover style um, image, but also this idea of the many-headed was not, was comes out of this idea that the kind of, uh, cr a crescendo of ideas, a crescendo of thoughts cannot be witnessed by one alone. They are witnessed by one internally because one is many, made up of many. Um, and bearing witness to those thoughts, to those ideas by the many that are inhabiting us is also where, you know, comes, I would say, kind of from a lot of the thinking in South Asia philosophically. <laughs> 